somewhere all bright and new. I have seen no other who compares with you. You belong among the wildflowers. You belong in a boat out at sea.
Welcome everyone out there on Facebook and YouTube, your assorted devices. Very glad to have you here for uh, actually a very special event here on uh, Friday, October 16th, a day, of, a day I've been waiting for for quite some time. The release of the wonderful box set, Wildflowers and all the rest, the expansive and generous and revealing uh, reissue of Tom Petty's Turning Point 1994 album, wildflowers we have some very special guests we're going to get into some deep detail about wildflowers the making of the record and the creation of this really wonderful box set but uh we're going to play some uh music and have some uh, talk from the guy at the center of it all tom petty in just a minute i do want to remind you that we can take questions so you can submit questions through uh, i guess whatever your chat thing is and uh, let us know what you're thinking and hopefully we can help you out there but right now before we get into any more detail let's hear from the artist himself tom petty the wildflowers album we we had a great time doing it rick rubin and i and mike you know we just it was a big hang that's what it was I had no control over what I wrote this time. You know, I didn't edit myself and I, I didn't hold back anything or I just let it come out. We recorded in Sound City and that was Tom's suggestion because he had recorded Damn the Torpedoes there, hadn't worked there since, and thought it would be fun to go back. Tom would look at the band and go, Wildflowers is the best record we ever made. You don't know. was received the way it was. It was just an incredible high for all of us. It went on and on and on, you know, for, for about a year and a half. Because we did much more than the Wildflowers album. We did, you know, I think 25 songs that we finished anyway. The essence of the Wildflowers record is that Tom wrote an astounding body of songs. Too many to fit onto one record. The record company talked us out of the double CD. That was a hard decision. That probably took up three months. What goes off and what stays? He very much wanted to re-release it. He thought it was really important because the legacy of the Wildflowers album 
loomed large in his career. He knew that the second half of Wildflowers was an important statement. We all put our heart and soul into it. It was a big endeavor, the biggest I ever got into. There's really a lot of love in that project, and we had a great time doing it. Mostly, there's just a lot of fun and joy in the tracks. It's refreshing. I'm, I'm happy that people get to hear this stuff, because it's really good. Putting out the special edition of Wildflowers with everything that was recorded. That would be something kind of fun to do. Wildflowers double CD, wow. the indulgent version. <laughs> Welcome back to a very special presentation celebrating the release today of Wildflowers and all the rest, a very generous and gorgeous package that brings Tom Petty's great 1994 album Wildflowers to life in so many different dimensions. I'm David Frick, journalist, Sirius XM host. Friday nights, I'm on the Friday Night Affair, Tom Petty Radio. Always welcome to join me there. And I am joined now by... Adria Petty, Tom's daughter, Brian Ullier, producer, engineer, and the guy who was, he was deep in the vault, pulling all of this material together and getting it in pristine shape for you to hear. George Draculius, who was the man on the ground, he was there <laughs> at the board as this music was being made. And uh, later we're going to have Nick Steinhardt from Smog, who was so instrumental in the packaging of this beautiful release, and Blaze Brooks, who did some amazing illustrations to go with the songs and actually capturing all of the uh, images that the songs really evoke as you hear them and as we know them so well from over the years. I guess really, I don't, there's so much here, but it's hard to know how to start. And I guess maybe I'll start with you, Adria, because in a sense, what is it that you felt Tom wanted to see with this package? He got as far as knowing he wanted the complete original two records set to be out. He was really into the idea of the home demos because they were such a big part of the concept, the creation of what he wanted to do. But once he had that in place and he wasn't able to finish it, where did you think it should go? I mean, I think that a lot of that process was done so intimately with Ryan, he would be better at answering that question of what my dad wanted and what he was agonizing over in the studio. But what I think we wanted uh, just in terms of the artwork and stuff like that was to be able to bring all the rest into the same plaza as Wildflowers musically and be able to give everybody a sense that that music was equally important to him. Uh, songwriters consider songs like those babies, their children to them. They don't like them being like lost in the archive forever something that was done at such a fertile creative time and so done so well. I think he really just wanted that album to get its place in history alongside its brothers and sisters. But I'll let Ryan answer a little bit more about how they went through the demos and stuff like that because he really is the man. <laughs> well, you know, it was that, that Tom wanted to get those songs that hadn't been released on that new disc that we put together and he, he and we we put those songs we found some other songs um and it was really it was really a matter of really trying to complete wildflowers in a way that complemented the album he knew he, he he knew people knew the album the way it was and he didn't really want to mess with that order but he wanted to put in that disc that had th these other songs that were missing and, and a people couple should of, remember that originally yeah. he conceived it as a double album with his co-producers, Rick Rubin 
and guitarist Mike Campbell from the Heartbreakers. So in a way, what he was doing was going back to the way he originally designed the ship to go out and sail the sail the seas. Exactly. And then it was a matter of, of when we found that disc, he decided that we were going to make that disc as, a, as an addition, the, the, all the rest to finish off the album. And then we started looking at the demos and we got through them, but we didn't get through them all the way. And then, you know, we, we moved on to other projects. We were going to come back to it. And, and you know, Tom left us. And so we, it was up to, up to everyone to, on, you know, on the team to, to kind of follow through with his wishes. Well, how did you then sort of figure out how to expand the story further when it got to the disc, the disc four uh, of Wildflowers Live, the way that he and the Heartbreakers brought those songs alive in a lot of other dimensions on stage over like the next 20, 25 years. And then in the like really deluxe packages, there's disc five, which is songs that never got close to the album, that there are different takes, different approaches, different musicians playing the songs. How did you sort of figure out what was going to tell the story intimately without just feeling like you're throwing everything at people as rich as the, you know, the vaults were? Well, well, Tom had a pretty, he he had trained us pretty well. He'd trained, <laughs> you know, he'd trained us like, you know, okay. I mean, you could just, you know, he had, he had, it was a very high bar. So to, in finding the live stuff, you know, we looked through everything and we found the best stuff, you know, and, the, and, the, and I think that really highlights how great the band was at taking Tom's vision and taking these songs and taking them to another, taking them to another place. And as far as the super duper, um, the disc five in, in the ultra deluxe version, you know, Adria uh, appropriately came up with the name of Finding Wildflowers because that's what it is. It was just that journey. And, you know, you'll, you'll, find that the thing I love about that disc is it just shows where they started up and and where and when you see wildfires you see where they ended up and in in places there are different places these songs were uh, this album was a and George probably knows more than anybody this album was about a year and three quarters journey because <laughs> you know, actually you know. what that fifth disc does is really show some of the roads not taken and you know some of the mus musicians that didn't you know weren't around for the final ride obviously stan lynch is there with the original heartbreakers before he moved on kenny aronoff from john mellencamp's band is playing drums ringo Starr is playing drums and it's clear that there were a lot of variations and combinations and actually george you can address this because you were there when all this chaos was going down could you actually tell that there was a road ahead for Tom and Rick and Mike as they were pursuing this or that the roads sort of came to them as they moved along? Well, it started, there were a bunch of projects going on when it first started. So they had to deliver a greatest hits record, which is um, where uh, Mary Jane comes from. And then there was a live recording in Mike's living room. There was also a Disney kind of special being done at the same time. And there were these drummers being auditioned. So it was a very fertile period. And it was like a round robin of, what are we doing today? Which one are we doing? Are we doing this thing or that thing? And then I think once it settled, once Ferroni was kind of on, you know, we're going to ride, we're going we're gonna to ride Ferroni. We're going to ride that toy or ride him. Uh, then it kind of became more focused on what it was going to be. And I think the idea was kind of, it was going to feel, after coming up with these records with Jeff, which are amazing, yeah, they wanted to have more of a group, even though it's a solo record, but have a human experience with playing with people on the floor, you know, getting instant kind of feedback, whatever. Um, so once that was decided, the other thing was decided was to be like, it wanted to hear the wood, if that's the best way I can explain it. So there's a lot of acoustic guitars on it, but the way they were doing before, they would stack them up a lot and there would just be like a wall of sound. But now it's kind of like you'd hear people playing. So that's one of the reasons, you know, I think it was like two years is because like a song like Don't Fade On Me, there's nothing there but these two guys playing. And once if someone makes a, bad mistake it's over you know it's not you can hear the strings i mean yeah. you can literally you, you hear the <laughs> fingers you hear the strings so that's like i think that was definitely what he wanted to accomplish you know what everybody wanted you know it's like he wanted to be as human as possible and it's feel as if he, he wanted to he wanted the record to reflect the intimacy in which the songs were taking place 
exactly. and where the mm -hmm. lyric, the stories that are in those lyrics. Yeah. And we're going to play uh, a bit of something right now, which is one of the original home recordings, and it's the Lynchpin song. It's the title song, Wildflowers. And I'm curious, George, when he had that demo, when you first heard that song, did he have a specific idea of how he wanted to approach it, or was it really born out of, here's what I've got, what, what's going to serve this song best? And in this case, it was a very quiet, intimate treatment because it's really a song about finding directions. Right. And that said, but it's also really complicated and, and, and dense and deluxe. I mean, every eight bars, something's happening. There's a lot of events going on. It's like, oh, here comes this sound. Here comes that sound. It's, 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 and it's one of the songs near and dear to me because they would punk me with it because they were working on it so long and all the time, every time... So if I showed up late, all of a sudden, I, this came, I found this later, though, but like I'd ring the bell to Mike's house. It's like, Draculis is here. Put up Wildflowers quick. So I'd get into the studio, and they're listening to Wildflowers. Like, didn't we finish that three weeks ago? <laughs> yeah, maybe we got to put something. Why don't you I'd like, go out there and uh, take this stick and hit it against that bass drum or something? Like, all right. Well, so, that, that, know, this boom. is where the two years went, obviously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, we're done. That's done. Yeah, we're just gonna mix it. Okay, great. And then, like you know, a couple of days later, it's like, Shukulis is at the door. Quick, put up wildflowers. I'm like, you. I'm like, what is going on? Am I taking crazy pills? Like you know. So it was a very long, elaborate prank, and that's also a lot what the spirit was, at least with everybody involved. There was so much yeah. fun and joy. I mean, I, I, it, it's sad because I didn't know how good it was at the time. You know, like it's never gonna be like that again. You know, it yeah. was just it was. We didn't know how good we had it. Well, this is actually how good it was right at the beginning. This is um, Tom Petty performing Wildflowers at home. So what you're getting right now is the book of Genesis. Tom Petty, the demo of Wildflowers. It doesn't get any more basic and beautiful than that with a really wonderful video of Tom just walking amongst the wildflowers. Uh, Adrian, what, where is that footage from? I'm sure people would be curious, like where, where's he walking? That's our house. That's our house back when uh, <laughs> the album was being made. And I guess he was goofing around with Martin Atkins and probably getting to know him before he ended up spending the year with Martin Atkins and going on the 400 days adventure, right? And, you know, when Wildflowers came out, and this kind of leads us to what's interesting about this forum, because you can ask us anything about the music and you can ask us anything about the visuals that we created. But when Wildflowers first came out, I think Rick Rubin and my dad were so kind of at the height of their powers that the packaging was very austere. It didn't have a lot of photographs. It was black and white. It was very simplistic. 
um, as we've moved into an era where standard definition photographs don't really hold up anymore because we're in HD land, um, we had the task of up a lot of this stuff and working, you know, the logo really didn't up a lot of things. So we went back and looked at everything. And the first thing we did was find all of this beautiful 16 millimeter. And I had a friend in New Zealand who I've worked with a number of times as a director and his really good friend. Um, at the beginning of the quarantine, they, they were open, obviously. And so they were able to work very deftly at animating and working with that footage and creating um, this sort of otherworldly uh, hang with my dad. And even for people <laughs> close with my dad, that just feels like uh, you get four minutes of just some alone time with him, you know, being a goofball. Um, so many things um, to confront when it was not dad putting this record out, because I think had it been dad's record to put out, the focus obviously would have been on all the rest pretty much alone. And maybe a few demos and then he would have toured it. You know, it would have, this would have really been geared towards a live presentation um, in trying to service the work that he did with Ryan to really sequence that music. Because I mean, Ryan, there are a number of new versions of some of the five previously released songs, right? On all the rest. Yeah, that's they're, right. Yeah. They're not the same as she's the one, which I think some people are curious about like, am I only buying five new songs? And it's like, well, in some sense, yes, but in another sense, you're getting those songs in a version that was honed in, in retrospect. Right? Because it actually gets to the point that these songs went through multiple permutations as George explains just in the studio. And then, you know, Ryan, as you were putting these various additions together, you've obviously got different versions of songs that are on the second disc. You know, Harry Green is a home demo. Uh, Climb That Hill, California, or alternate versions. So were you, was it hard to figure out like which permutations Tom either wanted or would have you know been happy with? No, it wasn't because, don't forget, that was the disc that Tom and, Tom and I worked on. So that's, that was completely Tom's like, I like, hey, hey Tom, I found a different version of Climb That Hill. So he oh, was actually changing that's way better. the record. He was changing the record like 25 years down the line. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The second, the second disc, the all the rest disc was like that. Was he was he had completely had his you know he was in control of that you know and we we just worked I you know I'd, I'd serve him up here's what I found what's what do you think yes and a, lot, you know? <laughs> a lot of people ask us why we didn't just make the double album that originally was sequenced and the problem and and Ryan obviously can speak to this better than I too but the problem was people had fallen in love with the first disc so some of those songs might have been yeah. staggered over two discs. Um, I think down the line, you know, I did beg Ryan to make me what he thought might be the double album from <laughs> right, this. Right, right. I have a I have a sneaky playlist that yeah. you know maybe one day we'll share with everybody. Even though right. it's not the dad's playlist, it's our best archaeological dig for it. Because I'm know. guessing that he never actually completed a definitive two record set. And maybe George, you can answer that. Was there an actual two disc sequence that? was formally submitted to Warner Brothers? It was a legendary whiteboard <laughs> that had all the songs in a sequence. And it, that's, that's a, yeah, it, it's, um, it was submitted. And I think at the time, they're just like, there's a lot of information. I mean, not that it wasn't, it didn't speak to the quality, just to where this is the early days of CDs. It's already a lot of, it's already like 70 minutes, right? It's like 75, 15 songs. It's already a, a big chunk. Right. Of, it's a lot of big chunk. And yeah. I think, you know, to to um, and an artist friendly as Warner's is, and they, you know they probably wouldn't let them do it. But they're just like, it's a lot of information, and you're gonna. There's other things will suffer, and maybe you'll lose the people's attention. And then, you know, nobody told Tom what to do, so he was like, <laughs> okay. And I, but, I went home, he took that in, and he's like, okay, you know, let me let's get this thing down to one. I think on the EPK it says, you know, getting it down to to one disc took yeah. three months. <laughs> yeah, and don't forget CDs at the time were like fifteen dollars. So a double CD, which is what it would have had to have been, would be like thirty bucks. Yeah, yeah. So. it might be prohibitive, I think, for fans. And and I think he really trusted Lenny Warnaker's gut. He was there to yeah. be under that aegis and learn from Mo and Lenny. And I think that that had huge sway over him in a way that other people had never had sway. Right, George? I mean, like uh, yeah. that was definitely the focal point was 
this collaboration with a label, which had never really been of interest to him at Universal because he never felt that they were copacetic in the creative process. Well, we've got um, a couple of questions here from folks and we should throw a couple in. One of them I can answer right away from Christina Ryan. She wants to know what show is the live version of Girl on LSD from? And it is Philadelphia, June 6th of 2008. So we've taken care of that. Um, Christina, thank you very much for that one. Um, Someone named Gregory Place asked, are we going to re-release 400 Days, which is a great question. Um, we are actually gonna play that in Tom Petty Nation sometime real soon. So if you're a member of the fan club, you can see that entire film sometime very soon. Stay tuned in Tom Petty Nation. And I see, a, I see a question from Gregory here that's asking about, is there going to be a uh, multi-channel version and if, of course there is there's going to be and it is available through amazon music hd on in atmos and it comes out of that little speaker over there and if you can see the you can echo hear it speaker everywhere. it's you can hear it and it is available so is it going to do quad can we have quad you know it's been a long time <laughs> well, I, you know what quad. you know what david i'll do a special quad just for you <laughs> <laughs> well actually there's one here from uh let me scroll oh saul Palomo, I hope I got that right, Saul. Um, what unreleased song on all the rest was Tom's favorite? And actually, maybe, Ryan, you can address that, and George as well, because, George, you were there when a lot of these songs were happening, and clearly there were orphans in the storm that you probably uh, felt kind of bad about. I, I can jump in really quickly yeah. about about the, the one song that, that Tom just loved is when we found this song, this Harry Green song. He just loved that. It was one of those things, once again, he was so prolific as a songwriter at the time. When we started looking back at this stuff, he just completely forgot about stuff. It was like, oh, God, that's a great song. And so we, we, we added a few more things to it and made it kind of more of a proper thing, add some harmonies and things, the way he wanted to build it up a little bit. But that was a real find. And, it, and the story goes, there is a real Harry Green. So, I think he loved Something Could Happen, too. I think he was very proud of that discovery because it felt so wildflowersy and so Beatlesque. I think, um, in terms of it being a carrot for friends and family to be like, "Hey, there's more stuff in here. You never heard this one." That was one that I definitely felt him kind of doing a happy dance about for six months or so. Were there songs, George, that you could tell he was really attached to and really felt bad about that? You know, when push came to shove, he just had to make that decision and cut it from the single disc uh, you know I, it, like adrian's saying they're all his children so it's you know it's it's a real uh, sophie's choice or tantalus whatever you know <laughs> yeah. but um I, I think at the time what happened was if two songs were kind of serving the same purpose when we were trying to go back to the one disc i think it was kind of like who had the most enthusiasm for you know for the one that stayed kind of a thing you know so it's it, it's hard to say you know it's just one thing he said in one of the interviews, too, is he was saying, you know, sometimes I write something for the sequence of the double album. And to George's point, if there was something in key or a tempo or where they felt like they needed a narrative bridge, right? Like we want to take it down for a second or we want to pull it up. Um, these are these are sort of things and motifs that he would talk about a lot in sequencing in front of all of us so that when we look at stuff, um, that we're doing without him on this, for example, the live, um, some of the discussions will be like uh, Ryan saying, look, I really want to advocate for driving down to Georgia, even though it's a little bit off era. They did one during this era, but Tom would never have a full show without one of these moments. And we all know that he's right. You know, these sort of discussions and guidelines come from years and years of him indoctrinating us into his way of thinking. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we hear his punitive voice in our ears going, why would you do that? You know, yeah. but, um, but I think uh, it's really interesting um, question to say which one would be his favorite because it is very hard to pick a favorite on this album. And yeah. I, I mean, to, to be able, I think, to go back with Ryan now in retrospect and look at like the best version of Hung Up and Overdue or saying, you know what, I hate the round in California. I don't want that one. I want this one. Yeah. Um, this is the one that I think should speak for that track. It's really cool to have his input and be able to then deliver that to everybody. Well, yeah. we're going we're, we're gonna to play something right now, actually, which is one of the songs on all the rest. And 
it's actually been a song that uh, technically Rod Stewart has owned for a number of years because he actually released it after Tom, you know, sent it over and suggested it to him, even though it wasn't on Wildflowers. But this is the version that was recorded for Wildflowers and is now featured on Wildflowers and all the rest. Leave Virginia alone. Leave Virginia Alone, one of the uh, treasures that can be found on disc two of Wildflowers and all the rest. The disc actually subtitled All the Rest. I'm here, David Frick from uh, Sirius XM, Tom Petty Radio, with Adria Petty, uh, Ryan Ulye, George Draculius. We've got uh, Nick Steinhardt and Blaze Brooks joining us in a little bit. Uh, I want to answer one more question before we get back, and this is from Justin Canavan. I hope I got that right. When and where was the live It's Good to Be King recorded? I can tell you that. The Fillmore, San Francisco, July 31st of 1997. And it's really a great long beauty. It's real. That's the Heartbreakers jam. And which, Ryan, I've mentioned this to you before. This is a part of Wildflowers that I really dig, is the getting to that bit where the band could just go long and uh, Mike and Benmon in particular could really take these songs to town to another different space yeah and i think that was a real important part of that you know we've been talking we've had some of these things with mike and ben these guys need to be able to have those moments in a live show so they don't just become a greatest hits band playing their own songs you know <laughs> they need to have those moments where they can stretch out and they can do these things and i think that was always a really great opportunity that song evolved in so many different ways it was an opportunity for them to just go somewhere you know and ha make something happen on the stage we used to kid, uh, they were painting the fence. <laughs> so let's go, let's paint the fence. It's like, Woo! like you know, sometimes it's like, we're like, man, you guys, 12 minutes on that one. That was a good one. <laughs> Actually, George, do you think the record would have turned out differently if Tom had taken some of these songs out live first? Um, or was it not I that think, kind I, of a record? Even though it was a lot, even though it performed right, I don't think it was that. It was a songwriter album at first, supplemented by these great players. You know, it's, but um, it's it's funny. Uh, I love climb that. I, I, I'm just gonna spit it out. But the climb that hill blues. Like I feel like we did Tom a disservice by not going down that route because that was a much cooler route than trying <laughs> to like force this this kind of beat on it and stuff like that. So this going back to the other thing. I guess I didn't answer your question, but I don't think no. I think that the song, you answered a better question. Actually, a better question. <laughs> I, I think that if you look at Finding Wildflowers on the deluxe editions you see what it would have been like live. You see it has the Heartbreakers filter on it, yeah. you know? Um, mm -hmm. You know, should I take a second and just show people what some of these packages look like? Because we actually want to, actually we should bring in uh, Nick Steinhardt from Smog and Blaze Brooks, the illustrator, both of them so important to the look and actual textural feel of this thing. Um, <laughs> Blaze so, is going for, let's, going for a beer. I don't know. Very dark <laughs> word, Nick. Um, I don't know. Maybe they turn the lights out where he is. It's okay. I know he'll come back. But, um, you know, anybody who is interested in, you know, Warner Brothers asked us to make a number of different configurations of this record. 
And um, Nick Steinhardt, who will appear at some point, was the gentleman along with Jerry Hyden, who created this beautiful world for wildflowers for me. One of my biggest challenges um, looking at the material was how do we elevate these other songs into the same space as wildflowers? And I happen to have a lyric book that we created out of uh, Blaze's artwork um, because I wanted him, I commissioned from him with some weird drawings and, and, and stint, like stick figures that I drew for him. And then many of which he came up with on his own. He made these beautiful images for all of the songs, including this great werewolf. And he directed um, a beautiful video for us that was quite impromptu when coronavirus hit for You Don't Know How It Feels, which we just thought might be a little giggle everybody kind of needed. Um, but I want to show just like how he took like something like crawling back to you. And then when we get into, you know, um, the world of something could happen, I'm not easy to know something could happen and look, it did happen, but we didn't know it was going to happen to the point where we all would actually need one of these suits. Uh, but, <laughs> but then, you know, leave Virginia alone. I mean, to me, th to be able to take some of these babies, these songs and give them a space that coexists with songs we're already in love with was really important because they're such beautiful and important songs. To actually, you. Blaze, the, the look of those illustrations and those pages, it actually reminds me of something my father had, which was a very old Boy Scout manual, which had oh, a very man. similar style from like maybe the 30s when he was a that, kid. And that's, yeah, I think I, I, I tend to uh, get a lot of inspiration from early Americana print work uh matches cigarette cards and i think that's kind of what you're seeing in there because it's it actually gets to sort of the the roots and almost the simpler time quality that the songs and and george the production and engineering really strive for on the original album and these illustrations they actually do look like they could have been uh advertisements for you know cereal or flat king biscuit flour you know <laughs> back in the day All right they remind me of um i don't know blaze you ever saw it but there's a one of the backstage passes from a heartbreakers tour years ago was hey i'm going backstage with tom Petty and the heartbreakers and it had that kind of <laughs> it had that kind of um joy to it you know they're all like a, like a souvenir i feel like yeah. you, you want to have it feel like simple and almost like you could put it on a bumper sticker just just something that you can take with you and remember that moment. And I right. think going into each one of those illustrations, I was one trying to battle the simplicity with the complexity of, you know, the song and what uh, Tom's standards were. And, and I think Adrian did a great job of uh, expressing what Tom's standard was to me and making sure that I was putting that into each and every one of those illustrations. Uh, Nick, I'm curious about, you know, you worked on the box set, An American Treasure as well, which was a very different presentation. It was more of an anthology of largely unreleased or rare work. And the approach there seemed to be um, more geared towards telling a deeper story whereas here you're actually focused on one particular era and i think the textural quality of the packaging is really important because when this album was released as a cd it was in a jewel case you know the paper was nice but there was really nothing to suggest that this was homegrown you know very intimate and personal music that tom was trying to get out into the world in a very special and uh expansive way like, how did you look at the music and what it required visually, and I think actually texturally as well, especially, you know, for things like the albums, the vinyl, and the CD, the special CD boxes? Sure. Um, yeah, like on a project of this scope, like everyone's talking, it's about reproducing things and elevating things to the highest quality, you know, just to honor Tom and what he would have wanted, but also just doing things the best way we can from the HD audio to the the packaging and the paper and the way everything's printed. 
um, you know, we've we've been uh, all holding up our packages very excitedly, opened this up last night and got through all the audio that I hadn't heard yet. Um, it's just so cool. But um, one thing I wanted to talk about particularly, like you're saying with the paper is like, this is an example of the level that we go to on a project like this is sampling every possible variable under the sun is that a wet the, print or a digital print, Nick? No, not digital. This is us testing everything on the actual stock to make sure that it's going to look 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this was, you know, Jerry, the creative director of Smog, and I messaging proofs back and forth um, to dial in things as granular as, you know, how many hits of white do you need underneath the wildflower <laughs> to make it the right color and the right texture? And then um, I'm taping, I'm cutting them out and taping them to like blanks of this to see if they look good against this kind of paper you know we're, we're like we the the process of these guys going through and and making i guess i think there's like six or seven configurations here right what nick and jerry bring beyond being enormously creative is they wanted to bring value to each and every one of these so that yeah. even if we didn't have the same real estate everybody that bought something got something maybe a little bit different and a little bit special and that's why like something like this has the skatefold with like these really beautiful graphic leaves. And then, you know, Jerry and Nick and I then beg Warner Brothers to let us have a little bit more money so we can print things on our sleeves and give a little bit more of a booklet to everybody right. in this configuration. And I think as people start to receive these, they're going to see that the, the packages are a little bit unique because I will have a conversation with Jerry or Nick, and Jerry will tell me, Blaze drew a picture of a joint, and we haven't used it anywhere. <laughs> Why waste a good joint? Yeah. Kind of the coolest thing ever. And, uh, can we please slip this bad boy into the magic? And, you know, the answer in many cases, because we were so rushed to do the bigger sets, was no, but on the four CD, if you buy the four CD, that's the only one where you get this really beautiful extra blaze print. Wow. And then nice. See the end, uh. They'll see the end papers too. And I wanted to make a point of pulling out the four CD just because I've seen a lot of people having some serious FOMO issues about this particular 9LP set that comes in this beautiful bag and everything. Almost everything that's in that bag is in the five CD. So if you're super bummed about that and you wanted a lot of goodies, you should buy a five CD set if you can afford it. If all you're bummed about is not having all the music in one place, if you want the demos, the live, pretty much everything except for finding wildflowers, oh, and that, that is the magic right there. That's the, five, that's the book for the five CD. But this four CD booklet, because of people like Nick and Jerry who are music lovers and Blaze who listened to all the music before you drew every single picture in here, you know, you will get pretty much the same booklet as any of these deluxe editions in a smaller format. And then you'll get these really beautiful sleeves where you can pull this in and out of your car or whatever and play it a lot. If what you're, what you're wanting really is just have the music physically and play it, this has pretty much everything under the sun that you would want from wildflowers, except finding wildflowers on it. Actually, uh, maybe uh, Nick and Adria can address this. What was the decision to go in the, the larger formats with the, that design image for the cover as opposed to the original photo, which is actually on the two CD version, which is of course closer to what two. Tom originally envision for the album how yes. did you come up with because i remember that little round uh image being a sticker that came with the cd i've still got mine stuck in the jewel case there round image was always on the little guy um it was very important to me to update the the bag because the original logo actually came from a beaded bag that they took a photograph of at a very low resolution and then created a targa image out of this is really nerdy and the and the logo ended up just getting really kind of twee and small and not so great to reproduce in this yeah, day. It, it felt and, anecdotal on the original and we wanted to kind of celebrate it yeah. a bit more. Yeah. I, I just think it just didn't it didn't hold up really 
um, if you wanted to reissue something that wasn't just wildflowers. I think what we really wanted to signify was this was the fully loaded edition of wildflowers and mm -hmm. that it had more than just what was on the previous record. So when you buy a deluxe edition, you get something that looks a little bit more like this with the beaded Maria Sarno logo on it that was hand beaded and it was very hard to find beads during coronavirus, but somehow we did it and she did manage to make 500 bespoke necklaces for that collection of, of one-offs. But, you know, for us, this was sort of the idea of this being a complete collection and it being the bat signal for all things wildflowers. I think when you have something that's a little bit more just pure, the two discs, we went with the original so that the people who are rebuying the three panel vinyl got to have their wildflowers vinyl again. Because I think one of the things that's important is to maintain the integrity of what was originally issued because that record speaks volumes to people now. And it's really, I think it's important for people to remember that at Tom's last show, the Hollywood Bowl, September 25th, 2017, he played five songs from that album more than he did from any of the other records that he could have chosen through his career. And it really was a statement that night that he really felt connected and committed to those songs in a way. It's not like any, everything else was at the end of the line, but there was something that he still resonated for him and that he felt still resonated for the people in the audience. And I, I saw it at Forest Hills on that last tour. One of the songs on the uh, Wildflowers Live is from my last show. And right. it's, calling, an back it's an you, right? calling back to you. And I remember the moment he played it that night and thinking, this is out in the open air, New York City, a beautiful summer night. I'm never going to have that experience again. Yeah, I mean, it's gutting to think that we'll never hear the band be able to put these songs from all the rest through their paces. Like, that's, to me, one of the parts of this that just hurts. You know, it's like, they, because obviously the Heartbreakers are one of the best live bands as well, and they interpret things on the floor very differently. Um, I wanted to just take the opportunity to show the five CD, if that's okay, since Nick is here and Blaze is here. Um, if you were considering buying it, it does have a lot of the stuff that was in. And I keep talking about this made worn bag, but we just had no idea everybody buy them the first day. So I've, I know people have FOMO, but I want to reassure people there are a lot of the things in that bag available, like this beautiful little lyric book and stuff like that that are super affordable. If you're really dying for all the goodies, you can get them. But this thing comes with a cert. It comes with Blaze's beautiful limited edition print of Only a Broken Heart with the lyrics. Um, it comes with some, some lyrics from Wildflowers and all the rest, which are in here, reproduced. And it has a cool little patch for your jean jacket and a sticker for your guitar. <laughs> You want to get it, you're going to want to get this, kids. You want to. <laughs> and then it's it going has, on my guitar. This is, this is something. It's already on my guitar. This is this is where you give Nick the love too. Is like Nick and Jerry went back and die cut and reproduced for 1994 the actual tour book that you will get if you went to the '94 show. And a couple of the cool things about this, interesting things, are you know you see the dogs with wings uh, logo. There's a really cool. Um, two page forward from my dad, one which talks about a guy wearing his pants backwards and cracking eggs on the sidewalk of a 7-Eleven. So if you're not curious, <laughs> knowing that, there's a lot more where that came from in here. And then in the back, it's really interesting because they list the personnel as Tom Petty, Michael Campbell, Ben Montench, Howie Epstein with Steve Ferroni and Scott Thurston who obviously then became a little more ingratiated into the band after this tour. They were still on parole at that time. Exactly. They were side breakers, I believe, at that time, and were ro rolling into a heartbreaker role. But it's kind of funny, like, if you look at, you know, he obviously was like, mm, you know, but there's a lot of, like, nice clues about that era and about the transitional nature of, of this time. And then there's this beautiful book, and I will – share with you guys that these were inspired by all of blaze's drawings the paper in the wind from to find a friend 
the honeybee. Um, you know, that was one of my favorite ones to do. It was uh, definitely a challenge trying to get the feeling of every single one of those illustrations into one piece. But I'm uh, I'm really happy the way that one turned out. But we Wait should up. play we should Let play me. a little music to remind people that all of these images are here to serve the songs and the work that George did in the studio with Rick Rubin, Mike Campbell, the Heartbreakers, Tom that Ryan did pulling it all together. Let's uh, it. Play, let's play some uh, Cabin Down Below because it's a great rocker and it just reminds you that this still is about the rock and about Tom's ability to rock the house. Get down. Cabin Down Below, rock and roll the way it ought to be, the way it was on Wildflowers. I'm David Frick here with Adria Petty, Ryan Ullier, George DeCoulias, Blaze Brooks, and Nick Steinhardt. Uh, we'd actually have one question here from Shiva. And uh, actually, George can address this probably initially. Maybe Ryan can jump in. The question is about the wonderful drum sound of this record, which we can hear right on that track, Cabin Down Below. The album was recorded largely at Sound City, which is actually, I guess, where um, Tom and the Heartbreakers had also done Damn the Torpedoes. Exactly. Um, how was that drum sound? How did you get that drum sound? And was that something that Steve brought in was, with his many gifts? Or did you really have to work to get that, that crack and the warmth at the same time? Uh, we used microphones. Uh, I would hope so. <laughs> and mental telepathy. <laughs> no, um, it, you know, they say a poor craftsman blames his tools. Uh, and But when you have Ferroni, that's really 75%. Ryan will tell you. I, you know, I was going to say the same thing. That's 75% of the thing. It's, you know, the guy, when you have a pocket like that and the way he's hitting the snare. But then, you know, spend, spend a couple, you know, setting up a couple hours and we get a little crazy. And they're like, let's put one down. And then okay, it's working, we're, we're okay, you know, so it was, but um, I'd say it's a combination of Ferroni, Jim Scott recorded a lot of it. Uh, Sound City, I don't know if you've seen the documentary, it's, you know, it was an old box amp factory actually before. Right. Um, and then um, what was great about it is no one ever tried to fix it. So in 1994, it felt exactly like 1974. You know, it wasn't one of those places where it's like, we're gonna improve it, you know, they left it, it's brown shag carpeting, T smelled terrible in a really bad neighborhood. <laughs> but the only thing that was good is a really good barbecue joint up the street, and that was about it. But um, yeah, I'd say it's just it's Peroni's playing and just you know just my techniques and yeah. the snappy oh. kind. Of, knowing that it was going to be that forward, we did yeah. concentrate on making it sound pretty you know snappy. As did was Doctor Doctor Hoagley Pogley's Tyler Texas barbecue to be yeah, uh, exactly. particular. Um, nice. But the other thing, just I'll, I want to jump in because this is important too. You know, I, I've recorded Ferroni a million times over the years, and there, you know his drum tech used to go, "You want me to hit the drums? You want me to get a sound?" I said, "No, it's not going to make any difference because when Ferroni shows up, it's going to be a whole different thing anyway." It really is the guy. One other thing, if you want to get a little geeky about it, is they it's a great sounding room, and and to to George's and to Jim Scott's credit, they put up room mics and they used a lot of those room mics so you can hear when you hear the drum like on on you don't know how it feels you hear it bouncing off the walls and that just puts you in the place with the guys 
It's almost like they were you were combining that getting that intimacy that the songs demanded, but also that garage rock vibe, literally the garage vibe that Tom and the Heartbreakers had come from in Florida as Mud Crutch when they first came out and they were playing, you know, psychotic reaction live on stage. Yeah. That was yeah. part of their DNA. All right. I mean, that was I mean, that uh, most of Wildfires, the vocals are so in your face and forward, you know, they're really there. But that it's just one on Cabin Down Below, it's just one side note. We used to call that our white trash dance party number. <laughs> and like, like every every time we put it up, every in the studio is like, you gotta dance. If you're not dancing, you know, we're, we're moving on, you know. It's like so imagine a bunch of, you know, guys in their forties. I was in my twenties, you know, sitting there doing the twist, listening to Cabin Down Below. Well actually uh, we have a question in here. Oh Adrian's got a question. I just, I just, I just wanted to answer because I can see. I was gonna explain, just because I think the, this right here, this dog with wings. Oh yes. Tiny, he has a little tiny um, R, right here. Ah, there. And that's for my dad's dog Ryder that passed away. Yes, we were really close to that dog, so I thought um, it would be cool if Blaze drew the dots with wings as my dad's dog. Um, so, I mean, anybody who goes through this or any version of this book, but the, the hardbound and the 9LP is probably the nicest one or the five. Um, the 7LP one's really nice too because it's a large format, but you'll get like pictures of dad in the studio writing this record. And you'll see that we went through and really curated this super carefully. And um, in the versions that have a track by track, I, don't, I think this one does, let me just check. Yeah, this one has um, a track by track, yeah. And it's it's incredible to read the forewords by Ryan and by George. Um, Ryan did Finding Wall of Flowers and George did the introduction for the home recordings. And you'll see that this crazy band of characters that you're looking at put a lot of thought into making sure people could kind of dig through here and have an adventure with it. Even if some of it's redundant or some of it's a version of a song already on Wildflowers, there's a lot of visual tactile things to dig into. Well, there's so. a really good question here actually from uh, Tyler who's asked this on Facebook and maybe George, you can address this and maybe Ryan from uh, your conversations with Tom. How did Tom decide which versions of the songs that he used from Wildflowers, the second disc, on She's the One, the movie soundtrack, and did he continue to work on that material after She's the One was released? Um, I think we picked some of the stuff, we picked up some of the sessions and, 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 and um, uh, what do you call that word? Oh, Jesus, sorry, embellished it. Uh, like Lindsey Buckingham's on stuff that right. you know he wasn't on uh, when during the Wildflower sessions, uh, but once I think once it came out on Cheese the One, he kind of let it, that was that was the end of it for him. He didn't go back after that until Ryan. You know. That's Lindsey yeah. in the back background going heart so <laughs> big, right? right. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah. And, and you know, Tom Tom kind of thought that the, the stuff on She's the One. He didn't. He told me he was thought it was a little rushed. He he, he wanted to kind of go back and look at those tracks again and take their time take the time with them. I mean, if you listen to one of the my favorite tracks on the All the Rest disc that just came out is Hung Up and Overdue. Yeah. You know, and this is the only track I maintain you're going to hear a Beatle and a Beach Boy on the same <laughs> record. You know, it's so and you know, and they end up, it, it, the the old version she's the one you can I mean Carl Wilson's there kind of in the background, but we just decided, wait a minute. That's Carl Wilson. It's yeah. like, why don't we hear him? You know, it's like, yeah, you know, so, so, <laughs> you know, you're going to get kind of more of a cinematic experience on, on some of these songs. Well, there's a question here from Michelle who asked this on YouTube. You know, Tom was obviously so creative in his songwriting and certainly this set is a great monument to that. But, uh, Adria, any, actually any of, uh, any of you, like, did he have any other creative outlets did, was was he did he think about films did he think about he writing like prose or anything like that the way people are doing you know rock stars are writing memoirs out the wazoo he doodled he drew and i think george has one of his yeah. uh, oh yes please show us that george it's a beauty <laughs> <laughs> portrait so, uh, by tom petty yeah. uh, which one's less... the one i can't right, tell you uh, <laughs> a lot less, a lot less gray and smaller beard. 
<laughs> but uh, I, it was funny because I, I think I was telling you guys earlier is that when I when I opened the box and I saw the, all the yellow, yellow legal pad, that's like a, a very vivid memory of always having the legal pads and writing. Either it was doodling, but then there'd be lyrics and anywhere in the house you'd be, any in the studio, wherever he was, you'd always have this yellow these yellow sheets of paper. Well, there's actually a question. I think we can address this to each of you. And this is actually from Jonathan Neal. And it actually gets to the original Wildflowers album. And I want you all to take a turn at this. Which song from the original Wildflower, Wildflowers album means the most to you personally? Nick, you're on first. <laughs> um, I'd say probably Crawling Back to You. And... Uh... It's got some of my favorite lyrics ever, and it's just such an incredible song, like one of the best ever written. But um, last night when I was diving into the packaging, um, the home recording of that just really stood out to me. I had to stop what I was doing and just in depth, in depthly listen. Yeah. Um, there's this amazing guitar solo that comes into it, and it just feels it's just so real and so amazing. Um, um, I'm, I was really privileged to hear that. Uh, Blaze, your turn. Uh, you don't know how it feels was a big one for me. Uh, I feel like I hadn't heard this song for at least like five or six years or maybe in a movie like in between then. And then when it came time to make the uh, animated video for it, I heard it over and over and over again. And uh, I think each time I heard it, something new spoke to me, especially the home recording one. It was like comparing and contrasting the two was just such a cool experience. Uh, so yeah, that one that one definitely hits home. Uh, George, your turn. Even though I didn't write them, they're all like my children. <laughs> and uh, for me to choose would be... Um, Which one would you know, send to college first? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like, it's, it, I think it's... Let's be down. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, it, I think it's, it's revolving. It, it, it revolves, but... Um, uh, I think maybe a only broken heart or, or um, hard to find a friend. Those like those really like, kind of like buddy ones, like really kind of small little buddy ones, really touch me. Uh, Ryan, you've heard so much of this, but going back to that original album and knowing that even in that form, it was really important to Tom. Is there something that sticks out for you just as as a place that you go for you know comfort and solace? It's good to be king, if just for a while. <laughs> to be there in velvet, yeah, to give him a smile. It's good to get high and never come down. It's good to be king of your own little town. That, to me, is the most amazing song. And the, the lyrics, it, that song just puts me in a trance when I listen to it. It's, it's just, um, it's, I'm something about it that's just sublime. And it's interesting, George, because the arrangement of that, it really is in a trance-like rhythm and form. It's as if that was the, the whole point of the song yeah, and the arrangement. Right. It's weird because it's, it's a very funny song, as Ryan just yeah. kind of points out, even with his reading, you know? And they, we, we used to sit in the studio and go, hey, be there in velvet? We used to like, just, <laughs> you know, that was like, that was, that would, you could do it a hundred times, and a hundred times someone would laugh when you did. And it's you know obvious I mean? that this guy is not the king. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty good, it's got clear about that, you know? But yeah. I, think, I think once the orchestra came in, it, it transferred, you know, transplanted it to a, a different experiences. I mean, we let the orchestra end it, which is unusual. Right. You know, da -da 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 -da. I mean, who does that? You know, it was like, it was yeah. extremely cinematic. And, it's sort of like uh, you let him put on the crown and the rose and then you take him away at the last <laughs> minute. Like, You're not the king. <laughs> okay, um, Adrian, it's your turns. I would love if we'd be able to answer a couple questions about the artwork, if anybody has any artwork, just to throw that out to the exact producers for a second, just because we do have Blaze, who's so talented and, um, and Nick sitting here. I I wanted to uh, say my favorite is for right now, for right this second is something could happen. Um, and probably the demo of Only a Broken Heart, which I love like the harmonica and yeah. just the, the emptiness yeah. of that just rocks my world. And mm -hmm. um, I um, am so excited that we had this opportunity to be able to take some questions and speak to fans because you know, we're we're new to this, taking over dad's company. We're new to making, you know, sure that those relationships are protected and cherished. And it's really important for me to hear from people who are dying to have this record or who care about this record. 
and make sure that they know that there's something out there for them if they want it. And it's easy to listen to if you are having a really rough time during COVID. This is a love letter from us to you. So we really want you to be able to have access to anything and everything from Blaze's artwork online to, you know, the music online that you can stream somewhere, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or whatever. Um, we want you to be able to come into the wildflower zone and enjoy yourself and be away from the television and your kids and homeschooling in the other room or whatever, um, you know, and be in Ryan, um, Ryan's weird music cave of magic <laughs> that he's been creating. And you can sit there and groove out to Blaze's pictures and kind of go like, oh, yeah, that sort of hits that that little cornerstone of that song that I remember. I want to hear the rest of it or I want to just trip out into this world. Because there is uh, actually one uh, extra question here, and this is actually for Blaze and Nick. And this actually gets to how you sort of inter or interpret what you've got to work with. Like, how much do you dig in to the music as a listener, as just, you know, someone who's looking for inspiration in the work that's been presented to you? And how does that influence the way you process and, and in Blaze's case, create those images? Like, is does the music directly speak to you or is it an atmosphere? How does it actually, I know what it does for me as a writer, but visually it's a different thing. Yeah, so each I of you take that one. I think there was so much going on um, in the world. Like there's so much uncertainty happening. And the one thing that we could hold on to was certainly Tom's music. And I just remember distinctly um, starting from the beginning of the record and I'd play like maybe 15 to 30 seconds and stop. I'd stop, close my eyes. You know, I'd have my pencil, paper or my <laughs> iPad open and I'd just start to like flow with whatever those first 15, 30 seconds was. And then I'd hit play again once I hit a stopping point. And then take whatever, you know, that, you know, that song was, send it over to Adria and Jerry, and we'd kind of just start a dialogue with, with that beginning sketch. Um, can, I, can I show one yeah. thing he did that I really love? Because my dad loved Mad Magazine, and he loved the fold-in. Right, yeah. <laughs> so we kind of tried to create, like, a little bit of a fold-in effect here, where you see, like, the sun connects with this beautiful labyrinth picture. And then, you know, for for Blaze to come up with this like incredible silhouette of dad sort of, I don't know if he's in the afterlife or he's in our dreams or what, but he's like out there with his awesomeness yeah. and the wildflower in the distance. Um, you know, getting Blaze to interpret that or only a broken heart, you know, just these sort of like lonely troubadour moments. Um, to me, it was such a dream come true to have such an old soul and such a like cool, edgy, young artist that works in three color um, and yeah. who really like approaches things from a craft standpoint the same way these guys do. Yeah. Um, well, Nick, how did you how did you get into the music? Because you were actually dealing with a much broader canvas. You're actually trying to create the dimension that this music has to be in you know people are going to walk into this thing that you've created and try to find their way clear to the music the words the images and it's it's really an incredible responsibility yeah um you know in in the case of uh, tom's work um i've been working on it with his stuff since about 2007 or 8 mm -hmm. um in addition to that you know with wildflowers i mean i remember uh you don't know how it feels like from tv when i was a kid so um the music's really important for me to start my process as a designer because you want to get in the headspace and delve into the lyrics and what the mood is. But Tom's one of the few artists where I've actually gotten to hear the music before I get to work on it. Like with whether it was Mojo or Hypnotic Eye, um, I think that was important for us to hear music before um, getting going to, for brainstorming purposes. And um, a lot of times you don't get that due to schedule or access or the record's late and it's not mastered and you just kind of have to go. Um, but with Wildflowers, you know, this is a record I've known since I was a kid. So I, I know it inside and out. And, um, you know, even from the original artwork and how to pay it respect while elevating it for this new set. Um, and also just the familiarity of knowing 
the like the cast of characters as is um, outlined in the track by track, like kind of knowing the important and fun bits of the original and what else to bring out um, when you're doing just something of this kind of like archival scope. Nick, you did, did you do Mud Crutch too? As well, did um, you those or is that John and Jerry mostly? Um, Smog, uh, John worked on the Mud Crutch records, yeah. As, uh, when you when you worked with dad, what was it like for you? Like what, do, can you describe sort of how he would give notes and like what his perspective and his vibe was? Cause he's pretty, he's a pretty tricky guy to like, <laughs> Yeah, a um, visual thing from, but like hypnotic eye, for example, is a very far out approach to I an. I love album. it. I love it. That was, I I've told this story a bunch of times to friends, but that's probably one of the most gratifying and favorite projects I've ever worked on because, um, I actually didn't meet Tom until later. I met him really briefly at the Echo once at a shelter show, and uh, he he walked in, was told who I was, and kind of leaned over and just said, "Not much of a PA in here, is there?" <laughs> just kind of like with one of his shirts. <laughs> and that's just like Tom's attitude to me for someone that's so like deep in it, but having not had a you know true personal relationship. Um, but I remember for Hypnotic Eye, we got, um, I think some lyrics from American Dream Plan B and that that was sort of like where his headspace was yeah. and was thinking a little bit about dystopia and news and technology, which is very relevant these days. Totally. Um, and everyone in the studio just got to work, I think for probably a month, month and a half. And I think we sent like 60 or 70 different covers and he picked that one out of the bunch. Yeah. Right. He also loved the baby with the remote control. He just, <laughs> he, I remember he showed that to me. He was like, look at this, this is great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, there's so much that we could discuss. We're gonna, we wanna give you a little bit more music before we roll out of here. I wanna thank everyone who joined us here uh, on YouTube and Facebook. And I definitely wanna thank Nick Steinhardt from Smog, Blaze, uh, Brooks for that amazing illustration work. George Draculius, the man on the ground with the music and always with the great stories. Ryan Ulliate, steward of everything that's happening in uh, Tom Petty music and right I, now. My, my one more thing I might add, oh. when you buy the 5 CD or the 9 LP, you get a free digital high-res download if you buy from the Petty or the Warner store. So. More okay, value so for your money, consumers. Happening. Yes. Do you get a download even if you buy a two CD, Ryan? You get the yeah. download for the. I think you get it for the four. You, if you buy the four, you get four. If you get the buy the five, you get five. If you get the nine LP, you get nine. If you get the seven LP, you get seven. You got to buy them from the Petty or the or the Warner store. That's what. That's all I, I also, know. Also, I also wanted to mention if you're looking at this and you're overseas. And you've really been bummed out because you can't buy Tom Petty stuff because it costs more to ship it than to buy it. We have resolved that issue. So if you buy something, it should be reasonable. It might take a week or two longer. But because of your friend Ryan Ulliot over here, or over there, or wherever he is. <laughs> Somewhere here. You know, we, we worked that out. And um, and I just I just want to thank the amazing smile of David Frick floating out of the darkness. <laughs> Coming in to make us feel and look cool and this weird pandemic universe. And I wish everybody watching so much love and warmth in this really weird time well, we are all surviving through. Thank you, Adria Petty, Tom's daughter, and, you know, helping us, you know, get the stewardship together. Uh, thanks, everybody, on screen and off screen for being here. We're going to take you out with a song that's actually from Disc 5. Finding Wildflowers, and I think it's it's kind of a nice way to go. It's a song that's meant to take you to, as Tom says, a higher place. Wildflowers and all the rest out today. I wish you all the best, good peace, good health, and lots of Tom Petty in your life. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>
Of cover. 